Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. <clears throat> That's normally all anybody remembers is the fact that I have six daughters, so <laughs> it's the defining characteristic in my life. But for tonight, as moderator, I have very brief duties. Just please think of me as a taller, heavier, uglier Brian Williams. Uh, <laughs> and we'll get everything started. I, I have the honor of in, um, introducing the uh, professors tonight. Um, they're all wonderful. Their resumes read like anything any of us would trade an arm for. They're very bright, or they wouldn't be associated with Carnegie Mellon, one of the finest institutions in the country and certainly the Tepper Business School being a, a highlight. Uh, but briefly, let me introduce um, Professor Marvin Goodfriend. Um, professor Marvin Goodfriend is the Professor of Economics at the Tepper School of Business and is also the Chairman of the Galliott Center for Public Policy. And I told them that briefly I would just mention undergraduate schools in case anybody was curious, uh, a BS uh, from Union College in Schenectady and his PhD from Brown University. Next is Dr. Spat, Professor Spat. Professor Spat is the Pamela R. and Kenneth B. Dunn Professor of Finance. Um, he has been at Carnegie Mellon for a long time. I graduated in 1989. I had him as a student. Uh, we'll just stop there. He's been there longer. Uh, he has his undergraduate uh, degree from Princeton University and his graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And Professor Telmer, um, is also an associate professor of financial economics at the Tepper School. He had his undergraduate degree from the University of Western Ontario and his PhD from Queen's University. Um, you've all been getting the emails, but uh, they're, they're each going to give their own 10-minute, uh, uh, roughly, uh, presentation on specific topics. I was told that uh, Professor Goodfriend, it's going to be monetary and physical policies. Professor Spat, it's going to be capital markets. And Professor Telmer, why is the European crisis a crisis for the Euro? So we'll let them get started. We will take questions at the end. Um, you know, we'll, we'll let them each have their 10 minutes of fame and we'll go from there. Professor Goodfriend. Wherever you're most comfortable, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna be out of the way. So if you would like to speak. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's great to see the turnout. And without further ado, let me get into my talk for half of 10 minutes. I hope I can speak a little bit more. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the fiscal policy dimensions of inflationist monetary policy. So you'll see what I mean. The broad-based support for price stability that's been in place in the United States for 25 years is at risk. Prominent voices in academia, in the media, in the International Monetary Fund, inside the Federal Reserve, you may have noticed if you follow these things, have proposed that the commitment to price stability should be relaxed in one way or another to concentrate on achieving more pressing objectives. The inflationist policy proposals, as I like to call them, inflationist proposals, are varied with respect to their objectives and their operating guides. For instance, objectives range from reducing unemployment to depreciating the real value of the public debt overhang that's crippling the country, to facilitating international adjustment within the euro area that I think maybe Chris may have some to say about. Anyway, in my brief few minutes here, I'm going to compare and contrast various inflationist proposals and consider their overall advisability in light of lessons from what we call the period of the great inflation. I see some people may, may, may remember that, from 1965 to 1985. The great inflation period is not only known for having had a lot of inflation, but I bet you don't, really, you don't know what the average rate of unemployment was relative to the price stability periods before and after the great inflation, that is in the 1950s and in the 1990s. The average unemployment rate in the great inflation period in the United States was two percentage points higher for a period of almost 20 years than it was when we had price stability. And I want you to keep that in mind as I go through and talk about the possi possibility of relaxing concern for inflation now in the, in the, in the uh, interest of um, achieving other quote, more pressing objectives. So I'm going to describe the alternatives that the Federal Reserve has to um, stimulate the economy at the moment in terms of monetary policy, credit policy, 
and um, what the Fed likes to call portfolio maturity extension. If you're an aficionado of this, you know that in the last few months, the Federal Reserve has embarked in extending the maturity of its portfolio. Now, interestingly, they're all at the zero bound interest rate for interest rates. They are all effectively a fiscal policy that the Federal Reserve is carrying on, even though it's not in the Congress. And I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by that. In order to understand the costs, the risks, the effectiveness of employing these measures more intensively, as is imagined in any of these inflationist proposals, we've got to understand their costs in terms of fiscal costs, taxes, <coughs> budgetary costs, taxpayers, and so forth. Okay. Let me start with monetary policy. At zero interest, the way monetary policy works is as follows. The Federal Reserve sells off a short-term treasury bill, or creates reserves, and buys long-term assets. 20, 30-year maturity is where they're moving. Um, and the way this works is the Federal Reserve is pulling down long-term interest rates, but also creating more liquid assets, either in reserves or in short-term treasury bills, which it's selling out into the market. And that broad liquidity is, in the Federal Reserve's view, stimulating the economy, at least in, it, it hopes that. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the transmission mechanism, the Federal Reserve's policy works by taking on interest rate risk onto the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Because what it's doing is it's lengthening the maturity of its assets, financed by overnight money in the reserves market, or else by financed by selling off short-term treasuries, taking the money, and buying long-term treasuries. This monetary policy at zero interest is taking on the mother of all interest rate policy risks on the backs of the Federal Reserve. Now, the Federal Reserve takes its profit, its quote profit, and transfers that to the Treasury. It's, it's the tax from money creation. So the taxpayer, on behalf of the Federal Reserve, is taking on, if the Federal Reserve continues with its policy, tremendous interest rate risk in the interest of stimulating <coughs> other objectives, and potentially very costly. And, and, and the bottom line for monetary stimulus is this. Um, the aggressive monetary policy of this sort would have to be used at a scale that's difficult to calibrate. It's very weak. The Federal Reserve has a balance sheet of about three trillion now, up from one trillion. But if the Federal Reserve over the next year decides to use this policy, monetary policy, more aggressively, it could have to push the balance sheet up to five, six trillion to have much effect. That's a lot of interest rate risk. And I want you to bear that in mind. At a scale that the Fed really doesn't understand because there's no statistical evidence out there. We're way beyond any historical norms for by which to judge the effectiveness of policy. So that's monetary policy. One of the reasons why, if I had more time, I'd go into why I'm reluctant to push, I would be reluctant to push monetary policy, even to stimulate unemployment at this point, is that the fiscal costs of doing so would be enormous, and it's not at all clear that the effect would be positive on the unemployment rate in the short run. And secondly, if it created inflation, we would be back into a great inflationary period with an average rate of unemployment maybe a percentage point or two higher for the next decade. So for these reasons, these are my basic arguments why we want to, I think, be cautious. So that's monetary policy. The other policy the Fed has, and I remember I mentioned three of them, there's monetary policy, portfolio maturity extension, and then credit policy. What about portfolio maturity extension? Well, here the Fed is, is really like a monetary policy because what the Fed is doing is selling treasury securities and buying long-term securities. It's taking on interest rate risk. The Fed is currently committed to doing $400 billion of maturity extension over the next few months. I have nothing more to say about that except it's a, sort of a, a baby version of monetary policy at the zero interest bound. And it's not likely to have much effect at $400 billion. If they decide to go really serious next year about this, you'll see a trillion or two of this sort of expansionary policy with, with the problems I've just mentioned. The third po policy the Fed could use is credit policy. How does credit policy differ from monetary policy? When the Fed pursues a credit policy action, it sells a treasury security, takes the cash, and instead of buying another treasury security, it lends the cash to someone, <coughs> maybe to finance a mortgage, 
to buy a mortgage-backed security. Maybe next year it'll lend money to some other part of the economy, maybe to help small business. Now these may be worthy goals, but they take credit risk on the balance sheet of the Fed on behalf of taxpayers. Uh, and the problem with credit policy is this. Credit policy works by interposing government's credit worthiness between borrowers and lenders in order to increase the flow of credit to one sector or another. In contrast to holding U.S. Treasury securities, any credit policy action, by definition, favors one sector over another. It's about channeling credit somewhere. You may have your favorite sector. The problem with credit policy is we all have our favorite sectors. And if the Federal Reserve gets in the business of allocating credit, <coughs> it creates a lot of divisiveness within the country. In fact, at this point, um, you know, you know that Ben Bernanke is better having his trouble in Congress. It probably would get a lot worse if the Fed chooses to go into credit policy in a big way, which it might do if it decides that the unemployment rate is rising. For them. But I want to say one more thing about credit policy. Um, uh, Credit policy, not only does it favor one sector over another, it, cre it is a fiscal policy action because it's putting future taxpayer dollars at risk. If some of these credit, these loans go bad, it means that the Fed takes the loss on behalf of all of us. And not only is it politically divisive, but it could be very expensive. In fact, it almost certainly will be. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna talk about, in the last bit of my talk, inflationist proposals. And the first thing I want to make, say is, whatever the Fed tries to do in stimulating the economy, um, it would be taking risks with inflation, which I've already said I wouldn't do, but it would also have to use these tools at a scale unprecedented to take on fiscal costs in order to take risk with inflation, in order to go after a questionable goal, which is the ability to reduce unemployment, not only in the current period, but over the next decade. Um, let me give an example of the kind of inflationist policies that are, that are out there. One of them is to tolerate higher inflation over the next few years in order to bring down the real rate of interest. This is a little technical. Right now the Fed is holding nominal interest at zero. And they're trying to hold nominal interest rates at zero out maturities at five, six, seven, eight, ten years. Holding interest rates down is regarded as a stimulative policy to increase spending. Well, to really get a kick, the Fed, in this inflation is particular, this inflation is the view, which has some currency with, at high levels in the government, the Fed would create inflation and keep nominal rates at zero. But then the real interest rate becomes negative, deeply negative. That, the idea there is the borrowing costs become deeply negative and maybe people will start to spend and will get out of this uh, protracted recession. It sounds good, except you have to ask yourself, our market's going to sit still for this kind of policy if the Fed tries to pursue it in a big way, say, sometime in the next three, four, five, six months. And my view is no, because what markets are going to want to do is they're going to see that lending on the basis of a maturity of 10 years, uh, when the inflation is trying to raise the inflation rate, is a losing proposition. Markets are going to almost certainly build in what we call inflation premium in longer term nominal rates to protect the lenders against this inflation risk. And that will undo the Fed's policy. And all you'd be left with is inflation, a collapse of credibility on the Fed's part. Uh, people on fixed income will be decimated. And I don't believe this policy will work. It has some support in high places. This is just an example of what I'm calling an inflationist policy. And I'll give you an example of why I think it's risky. Having said all that, you might say, well, this is open and shut case. Let's not do it. But there's plenty of, plenty of political pressure on the Federal Reserve to do something. It's an election year. And we'll see what happens. Um, I think I'll, uh, let me just finish with the last paragraph and say this. Today, inflation expectations are better anchored than they were in the bad old days of the 1970s. If you follow the news, you see that the market seemed pretty sanguine at this point about inflation, regardless of the political pressure to make push the inflation rate up or accept a higher rate of inflation. So markets do appear to believe that the Fed has learned from past mistakes. Here's what worries me, though. Inflationists inside the Fed and outside the Fed would have the Fed use this leeway to take risks with e easier monetary policy to bring unemployment down. In other words, they want to push the Fed's credibility to the limit as far as in order to, do, to try to bring the unemployment rate down. It's a worthy goal. My concern is 
that the politics of the Fed means invariably it will be pushed over the limit and will have the consequences I've been talking about. Worse, aggressive inflationists want the Fed to make the same mistake as the 1970s to try to reduce real interest rates in the way I described. <coughs> Uh, the lesson from, from my point of view from the great inflation is to resist the temptation. Play to catch up with inflation is a losing game, and the, making low inflation the priority yields a lower unemployment rate on average over a decade or two. Uh, and, and I would hope that the Fed is able to resist this tremendous temptation now to dive back into an inflation. Um, and my last point is remember, the only instruments the Fed has at the zero interest bound to make this happen are fiscal policy instruments which in impose tremendous costs on taxpayers to be used at a scale that they'll need. So, so in, in, my, in, in my remarks, uh, uh, I'd like to focus on on, cap on the capital markets, and specifically the interplay between governments, the U.S. government, European governments, and the markets, from the point of view of how of how the markets regard governments, but also how governments um, regard the markets, and it's particularly the latter uh, theme that I want that, that I that I want to emphasize. Um, <coughs> certainly, it's um, certainly it's very clear that the capital markets are suspicious of of, so of sovereign credit, um, and I think as a result of that, the the sovereign the sovereigns um, and the, go the governments have become suspicious of, of markets. Um, I, I think to some extent, under trying to undercut um, the uh, acceptability. Of independent evaluation um, of the quality of actions um, of these of, of these of these gov governments, and I want to point to a whole series of examples of, along the, along these lines in my in my remarks this evening. Um, so the first example goes back to early August, um, and that's the example involving credit rating agencies. Um, the, you, of course, S&P, as, as, as I'm sure most of you are aware, S&P, uh, shortly after the, uh, the debt ceiling fiasco in Washington, uh, S&P downgraded the U.S. government. And within 48 hours, the Secretary of the Treasury was on the Sunday talk shows talking about uh, the terrible judgment uh, that S&P had, had, had made. Now, it's true that the secretary was able to point to a, a two trillion dollar arithmetic error um, by S and P, but um, uh, so he had some he had some uh, facts that he was able to bring in support of his position. But the fundamental arrogance um, um, of someone who's being evaluated by an independent evaluator in being dismissive of his evaluator is really striking. Um, you know, as as professors, for example, we're evaluated <coughs> all the time. When we submit papers uh, to academic journals, we get reports from reviewers. And frankly, I think the last thing that a responsible academic would, would do in the face of a critical referee's report is to simply try to slash and burn <coughs> um, the referee to the to the journal editor. Mm -hmm. um, um, what's really crucial is that a responsible academic needs to think deeply about the feedback. That's not to say that the academic is necessarily going to like the feedback, but it's important to think deeply about the feedback and what can one do better. And this is, I think, part of what the, what the Treasury kind of missed um, in its initial, in its reaction to S&P. And it's not, the U U.S. is not alone with respect to this. In Italy, we've heard a lot about Italy in recent weeks. Well, back in August, the Italian government actually raided, it, it had a police raid um, on one of the on one of the credit rating agencies. <laughs> By the way, this wasn't even new news. The whole issue of credit rating, credit ratings and downgrades. This wasn't new news. The, S the SEC, my, my former, I, as many of you know, I served as chief economist at the at the SEC uh, from 2004 to 2007. So my former colleagues seem to have gotten in their head, according uh, to media reports, um, that there might have been insider trading 
on the basis of um, this S&P downgrade being in the works. So apparently they've kind of gone into S&P and asked S&P, well, who had knowledge of the downgrade? Frankly, the capital markets kind of knew that there was a substantial likelihood the downgrade was coming. Um, um, but the SEC is asking who in S&P knew. Now, are they asking who in the Treasury, who in the U.S. Treasury was also notified? Um, you know, at least they're not certainly leaking that they've asked the Treasury for that information, and I rather doubt that they have. By the way, another, another credit rating agency, uh, a relatively newer credit rating agency named Aiken Jones, they, they actually downgraded the, the, the Treasury a month earlier. So certainly the possibility that one of the majors could downgrade the Treasury, this really shouldn't be uh, a surprise. So credit ratings, I think, is sort of one, I think, potentially important uh, <coughs> example, certainly, of the suspicion of governments. And um, I think the governments don't like the message that they're getting. Um, and obviously, this is not only about the US government. Obviously, a lot of downgrades in Europe uh, right, right now, as, as many of you are aware. Well, second example. The, the example of short selling of, of instruments, and especially the bans that you, a number of European countries have imposed uh, on naked uh, uh, credit default swap uh, transactions. Credit default swaps are basically a way for financial institutions to hedge risk, risk exposure. Um, uh, needless to say, a lot of sovereigns don't seem to like um, the fact that folks are writing contracts to some degree on the sovereign's performance, whether they're going to pay their debts and whether the banks are going to pay uh, their debt. Some have even gone so far as to try to bar naked uh, C CDS. They, they certainly haven't learned the, the lesson um, that my former boss at the SEC, Chris Cox, tried to articulate on his way, on his, on, as he was leaving the SEC. When the Washington Post, in, 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 in Cox's exit interview, when the Washington Post asked Cox at the end of 2008, what was the worst mistake he made at the SEC? It was, he said, that it was listening to his colleagues on the President's Working Group, that's the Treasury and the Fed, that's the head of the Treasury and the head of the Fed, um, and, and agreeing to, to ban short sales on financial stocks in the U.S. while the TARP legislation was being debated. That's what the chairman of the SEC thought was the worst mistake that he, that he made. The European governments clearly haven't, haven't learned uh, at all from this. I, I think in part because they don't like the information that, that's kind of emerging from the CDS. So they want to just sort of dismiss um, um, the CDS as sort of irrelevant, as, as sort of being manipulated. Um, without, again, taking seriously the information that's being produced. They, they somehow have managed to also structure, at least in the case of Greece, um, a default that <coughs> the arbiters of these, ma of these matters have actually classified as a voluntary, uh, appear to have classified as a voluntary event. Um, um, and, you know, without weighing on the legal uh, details, um, I, I think this is also very short-sighted. Now, it, it presumably what it reflects is that those prime ministers in Europe, they must know which of their banks have written a lot of CDS. Um, and when they have to go in to bail out those, those banks, um, they don't want the political costs associated um, with when the public realizes that, they, that they're, they're rolling with respect to the CDS. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, this is very unfortunate because um, Basically, this is going to this is going to make matters worse over time, because to the extent that investors legitimately, by the way, if you think of who takes a voluntary write down of fifty percent, <laughs> you, know, you know, I think this sort of goes without this kind of goes without saying, you know, that the, the notion of voluntary this this kind of reminds me of Bill Clinton um, with the question of what does the word is mean, um, um, you know, the question of what does the word voluntary mean um, in this context. Fifty, it's not imagine percent has anything to do with, with voluntary. Um, but I think this is really dangerous. Why? Because going down in the future, this is going to undercut the viability of CDS. And I think the, the import of this is that uh, down, down, the road, down the road, um, when um, folks who have provided funding um, are going to want to hedge, they can't use CDS, what are they going to do? They're going to simply sell the bonds. Well, what would be the situation now if the bond, if, if in fact the the market participants understood that the CDS wasn't going to pay off? Frankly, those folks who were right, who were getting CDS insurance, they would have been selling the bonds earlier, and frankly, the yields would have even been higher, putting yet more pressure 
on, the, on these governments. And the governments, um, because I think they're all focused on the present and not on the future, they don't, they don't really understand um, this aspect of the structure of markets. Yet another issue, the Basel, the structure of Basel in sovereigns. So ba the Basel capital structure arrangements that um, focus on the details of how to, how to measure uh, a bank's risk and what capital should be required provide huge artificial incentives um, for banks to hold sovereigns. How do they do that? Well, because the Basel, the Basel Committee viewed <coughs> the risk of sovereign credit as zero. They view it as zero up until it's not zero. Mm -hmm. um, and think about who makes up the rules. Um, I mean, what a bizarre system. So we have this huge subsidy to encourage the banks to hold the sovereign credits um, in clearly a way that's not sus completely sustainable. My next example. So the central bank, the central bank in Europe, the, the, the principal central bank in Europe, of course, is the ECB, the European Central Bank. Um, and it, it, um, uh, it, 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 it's, 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 it's create, it, it's involved with the, with, with the, with the euro. So the European Central Bank has taken, uh, you know, I think at the, with the encouragement of some of the key European governments, has taken an aggressive view of its mission, um, and, and has tried really, has tried very hard to stabilize the situation in Europe. And what has it done? It's bought, it's bought a lot of sovereign bonds. Um, well, this, this, you know, so it, in some sense it views, it views, so what it's now trying to do is it's trying to, it's trying to um, stabilize the situation with these bonds. But this is, this is, a, this creates a lot of complications. It creates in the language of our, of, of, of the discipline of, of financial economics, a difficult signal extraction problem. What do I mean by that? Well, it's hard for, you know, first I was thinking myself last week, oh gee, the Italian bonds, people tell me Italian is kind of good. Now, I don't know if I should believe them or not, but people tell me Italian is good. Should I buy some bonds? At first I thought, maybe I should buy some Italian bonds. Well, once I figure out how to do so. But, but, but then I realized, no, I shouldn't even bother to figure out how to do so. Because I realized, no, I can't trust these market signals. Because um, uh, what's happening? The ECB is buying the bonds, and one, it's, it's impossible to tell to what extent are the prices of these bonds artificially high because the ECB is the marginal, is in effect a marginal investor. They're the ones who are buying the bonds. And basically they're presumably buying the bonds from, from more rational folks who are, who are selling the bonds. And then I realized which side do I want to be on? Do I want to be on the side of the hedge funds who are selling? Or do I want to be on the side of the ECB? And obviously that was sort of obvious to me. Um, and so this created a, lot, a lack of clarity on private pricing. But what does this lack of clarity on private pricing do? do? It discourages rational investors from participating in these markets. Um, basically, because folks know that the ECB is out there, it's very hard for an investor to think seriously about buying, about buying these instruments. A huge, seems to me a huge problem. Um, uh, CNBC reported earlier this week that two weeks ago, the ECB bought nine, more than $9 billion of sovereign debt. <coughs> Last week, bought more than $4 billion. Now, the, the data that CNBC reported didn't say which countries they're buying, but obviously there's a lot of speculation as to which particular countries are getting a lot of the, the, the action. So I, I, I do think, more, more broadly, um, that, that sovereigns uh, are making matters much worse, in the next, at least in the next anti-sense, but I think even in the next post-sense, by, by blocking or discouraging various tools and getting in the way of, of the ability of markets to respond. Um, I, I think this is, this is amplifying, in my mind, this is amplifying the problems um, that, we, that we confront. Now I know, I know that a lot of governments feel um, that, the, that these prices are manipulated, manipulated prices my former colleagues at the SEC, in fact, felt that way in 2008. They were very much out there as, 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 the, world, as the world was collapsing in the summer of 2008. They were out there every which way saying, um, you know, emphasizing that manipulation on the short side of the market violated the securities laws. Well, of course, it, of course manipulation violates the securities laws. <coughs> but the point, but the, 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 the point was, have they, brought, have they brought, even now, three, three and a half years later, have they brought many cases along those lines? I'm not sure I can identify even a single case that they brought along these lines. No, I think what, the, what, the, what, what my former colleagues missed is instead of being so concerned that maybe folks are manipulating the markets, that perhaps what they should have done 
given their given their role um, in 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 the in the in the markets, they should have done this. They should have called folks in and said, "Look, we don't understand. You know, from our analyses, we don't understand um, why 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 things are so bad. Can you help? Can you help us understand? Uh, can you be a good public spirited citizen and help us un and help us understand? Um, because we do have a lot of respect for markets, but that not what was not at all the tenor." That took place. Well, I, I used my ten minutes, or I think perhaps mm -hmm. I used a little bit more. So let me let me stop mm -hmm. at this at this point. Thanks, Mr. Right. So I'm going to take my time uh, and talk a little bit about the euro crisis, um, and. I want to raise some questions uh, about the sort of uh, popular, what I view as the popular wisdom in terms of what the, the big issues are and what's, what, and what's going on. Most of my comments are going to be organized around the idea that, um, well, we're obviously living through a European uh, debt crisis, and uh, we're obviously living through an even bigger crisis in European federalism. Um, it's perhaps not so clear uh, what it means that we're living through a crisis for the currency called the euro. Okay, so that, that, that moves, I'm going to raise some questions to get you thinking about that. So I asked myself, if this is a crisis uh, for the euro, for the, the monetary union, okay, for the liabilities issued by the ECB, what exactly does that mean? <coughs> so here's five possibilities. Uh, only one of which, I think, is really substantial. Okay, but you read about these possibilities in the paper all the time. One, uh, it's a crisis uh, of confidence in the extent to which the ECB is a strong, independent central bank. Okay, that's kind of the classic uh, currency crisis that we've seen uh, in the world now for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, two, it's a crisis about membership. Some members might bail out of the monetary union. This is going to be a new one, and that's going to do damage to the system. Three, uh, it's a real exchange rate crisis, and I'll be explicit about what exactly that means when I elaborate, but it's a real exchange rate crisis that might bring the nominal exchange rate regime to its knees. Four, it's kind of an ideological crisis in the sense that uh, People, governments uh, have realized that this monetary union was just a really bad idea. And we have to uh, tear it down, and the costs of tearing it down are going to be enormous. And then five, uh, it's a bank run crisis, okay, generated by the inexistence of a lender of last resort. Okay, something that uh, both Marvin and Chester touched on. Now, um, these things, I'm just. Uh, these things are not mutually exclusive, okay, but I think there's, they're kind of separate issues to some extent. Okay, they're all obviously out there. My view is the first four are, uh, are to some extent misguided and are certainly dwarfed by the fifth, this leader of last resort issue. So let me elaborate a little bit on each of these. Okay, the first one, uh, it's a crisis of confidence in the, in the extent to which the ECB is a strong independent central bank. Um, Markets uh, have or will lose faith in the value of the euro, both in terms of its purchasing power in goods markets, inflation, and, and in terms of, uh, of other currencies, currency devaluation. Okay, so this boils down to confidence in the central bank. I don't see it right now. Markets don't see it right now. It's, kind of, it's a little bit hard to make this case right now. Okay, since its, in since its inception, the ECB has had, had all the hallmarks of a strong independent central bank. Okay, it's clearly lost some of that credibility lately with the bond buying scheme that Chester was just talking about. But I think, uh, you know, in terms of where we're at now, um, it's pr pretty reasonable to still think of the ECB as a strong independent central bank. So euro crisis kind of doesn't add up there, at least not now. This is where we are. Might this change? I think the best case scenario is that it doesn't change. Okay, I give this a probability of about uh, a half. Okay, and, and uh, that involves the ECB staying above the political fracas and the European governments, the European Stabilization Fund, the IMF, and so on, dealing with the debt mess. No euro crisis. Okay? Where does the other 50% probability go? 
Uh, it goes uh, to this, this scenario when the ECB uh, becomes a lender of last resort, not to the banking sector, but to the governments. Okay, and uh, in that case, um, we have an, a possible expansion of the ECB's balance sheet in the trillions, and, uh, and then the possibility of the kind of currency crisis that I'm talking about here, the collapse in confidence in, in the value of the currency. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about lender of last resort at the end. The second sense in which you might call this a crisis is in terms of membership. Okay, the idea is that uh, it's going to be a disaster if some governments like uh, Greece or Italy go back to the old legacy currencies. Is this a crisis for the euro? Well, first of all, I don't think it's very likely this is going to happen. And the simple reason is just the costs of going back to the drachma are, are enormous. Okay, and the uncertainty associated with this is enormous. We basically have one data point uh, on this, and it's Argentina in 2001. <coughs> We saw the costs there. This is in the middle of a huge firestorm, but the costs were pretty big, and there's many reasons to think that the costs of going uh, back to the legacy currencies are going to be even bigger in Europe. Moreover, um, you know, I haven't done this poll, but my guess is if you uh, did a referendum in Greece right now, uh, there's no popular support for doing this either, for the very simple <coughs> reason that uh, Greeks don't want to give the printing press back to uh, their horribly incompetent government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, uh, Greeks tell me this. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, second of all, uh, even if Greece leads, I don't know, this seems to me to be more Greece's problem than the Eurozones. Okay? The likelihood, for example, of Greece defaulting, going back to the drachma, being kicked out of the European Union as a result, and the whole house of cards coming down, seems unlikely to me. Okay, because this would require the, uh, the European Union to actually start enforcing some rules, and they've done none of this yet. Uh, I'd be shocked if, uh, if they did this now, in terms of uh, Greece defaults, uh, out they go. I just don't think that's going to happen. My best guess uh, is, is uh, here's something that might happen. Nobody leaves the monetary. Some countries might default and, uh, and become kind of like Ecuador. Uh, using foreign currency as their domestic currency, but having no say about how monetary policy is conducted. Not that they really had much say in the game. Okay, so if you think that that's uh, not kind of economically viable, I would say, you know, uh, what is not economically viable? A banking system existing by creating liabilities uh, that are denominated in foreign currency. Just look at the role the U.S. dollar has played in the international economy for decades. Okay, this is totally viable. So economically, uh, some countries um, staying, continuing to use the euro, okay, but uh, leaving the eurozone in terms of uh, uh, having a say in terms of monetary policy, having access to all the things that are involved in the European monetary system, and so on. That's, that seems uh, economically plausible to me. Politically, of course, uh, who knows? Okay? It's clear what Greek people want. They want a default, and they want to stay in the eurozone. <laughs> what the Greek political class wants uh, could be something entirely different. The third sense in which this is, you could think of this as a euro crisis, is that it's a real exchange rate crisis that might bring down a nominal exchange rate system. And all that means is that you've got a bunch of countries like Spain uh, and Greece and Portugal, uh, to a certain extent Italy, where costs are, are very high. Okay, costs are very high because the government's been giving huge raises to government uh, employees uh, and so on and so forth, and costs need to come down. Those economies need to become competitive in one way or another if growth is going to continue. And so the argument is uh, the easiest way to do that is a nominal devaluation. Okay, and, and um, there's certainly um, a lot to that. And, uh, but my view is um, while uh, a nominal devaluation one could argue that it's less costly than having to reduce wages uh, and prices and, uh, and deal with all labor mobility and so on and fight the unions. Um, the cost associated with going back to the legacy currencies uh, kind of make this, um, the, the, the benefits to, uh, to leaving the Eurozone and devaluing uh, is kind of too big in my mind. Ireland seems to be doing this internally. Okay? Ireland seems to be bring, bringing down wages and, and, and prices. The question is, is can Spain and the like do it? Um, history says uh, you can't do it without political change. But we've been seeing political change happening. It's happening as we speak. 
okay, right now there's an election coming up in Spain and so on. So, uh, no, there's that. Four, um, this is just a really bad idea to begin with. Okay, we have, it has to go, but the costs are gonna be, are, are gonna be huge. Uh, this argument comes uh, in lots of varieties, okay? Things like, Europe is just way too large to be any kind of sensible common currency area. Bad idea to begin with. A one-size-fits-all monetary policy won't work for such vastly different economies. Trade imbalances, Germany's surplus, Spain's deficit, are going to persist forever because we can't rely on the exchange rate to rebalance things. Uh, the governments, they gave up this valuable policy tool when they signed up for EMU, um, and they should get it back. Monetary union leads to credit boom and asset bubbles. Okay, that's the, the various... Uh, criticisms that one hears uh, about monetary union. Now, most of these arguments make sense, are coherent in one way or another. The problem is that there's just not a lot of empirical support for any of these things. Okay, so me, I'm, I'm not convinced uh, that EMU was or is a bad idea, and, and that this is a kind of a, an ideological crisis in this sense. Um, most of these ideas are based on, on, on uh, here's the economics of them. Uh, prices and wages and labor and capital somehow uh, can't uh, flow in the right way uh, to where um, where they should in order to uh, allocate economic resources properly. And economists use language like rigidities, inflexibility that, uh, that characterize uh, the markets that we live in. So then the idea is, well, if we just have this one very flexible price, the nominal exchange rate, it'll kind of undo all this other inflexibility and uh, make the economy function more efficiently. Now, that's a perfectly good story, okay? But if, if it were really a first order issue, we would see a far tighter connection between exchange rates and macroeconomic variables like trade balances and cyclical changes in productivity and real wages, and we just don't see that, okay? What we see is that short run changes in exchange rates are just random noise. And in the long run, the exchange rates don't matter very much. The few people who have taken international finance from me learned learn to call that purchasing power pair. Mm -hmm. okay, those who haven't uh, have opened up The Economist magazine and seen that Big Mac index, it's mm -hmm. the same deal. Ultimately, mm -hmm. the Big Mac on average costs the same everywhere. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Um, in the middle, there's these periods like Spain, France, and Italy in 1992, Argentina in 2001, and many, many others when nominal exchange rates moved in the right way, but in the context of a big crisis, okay? They moved in the right way in the sense that, that in Argentina, yes, the fact that there was a big devaluation um, made the crisis less severe uh, than it otherwise would have been, okay? Because it, it reduced costs. But these crisis events, these are quite different than the typical story we're told in which the exchange rate accompanied by the benevolent policymaker changes in a way to buffer and mitigate <coughs> the frustrations that, that mitigate our markets. Okay, I think of nominal exchange rates as they're kind of like crisis insurance for, for governments that might pursue policies that are inconsistent with one another. <coughs> Greece right now realizes, or certainly uh, thinks, wishes that it would have bought that crisis insurance. Okay? Uh, but the, the insurance doesn't come for free. Okay? Europeans van uh, vanquished flexible exchange rates for two reasons. Okay? European Monetary Union, in my mind, happened for two reasons. One, uh, to build a more integrated, cooperative economy to flourish and avoid war. Uh, two, to get rid of this pointless noise of, uh, of nominal exchange rate variation. And I don't think that's a, a controversial uh, uh, motive for, uh, for EMU. Obviously, one isn't working very well, a cooperative thing. Mm. Um, it's not clear to me that by putting two back in there, you're gonna make matters any better. Finally, uh, the lender of last resort. This is the big elephant in the room. I think this is the nature of what we mean by a Euro crisis right now. Okay, we have this system which is sort of a contradiction in terms. The ECB can prevent bank runs, but it can't prevent government runs, uh, even though a huge source of the fiscal problem are the banks. I don't know how this is gonna end up, but it's hard to tell a story where it's gonna end up well. Um, the uh, um, the existence of a lender of last resort is just sort of uh, given markets uh, a, uh, a big thing to speculate against. And uh, they may be right, they may be wrong, but what we've seen over the last uh, uh, five years or so 
is that uh, um, in certain cases, um, we see evidence of, uh, of institutions that rely on short-term funding, being, not being able to get that short-term funding and a <coughs> liquidity crisis. Okay, so the, crit the critical thing that, the, that the, the ECB and the European governments face right now is which countries are solvent, which countries are, are just illiquid and, uh, and are facing this big spiral of, uh, of, of interest rates and, and what to do about that. And it's clear that the, the inexistence of, a, of an institution that's, uh, um, that's built to be the lender of last resort is a problem. So some last thoughts. Um, this is a crisis of federalism. One can't have a federation without, at some point in time, having some transfers go from strong members to weak members. Uh, discipline, of course, matters. It determines the political viability of these transfers, and it's something that Europe has been in, in short supply of from the word go. But nevertheless, a federation can't continue to exist if its members are unwilling to provide a financial backdrop for each other. Ideally, this is a job for the fiscal authority and the elected governments, not the central bank. It is firmly echoes a bunch of, Mar Mar of, of uh, Marvin's comments. However, the Given the size and the speculative nature of financial markets in combination with the leverage that seems essential for a well-functioning banking, well banking system, it might be necessary for the central bank to, to, uh, to get involved. Um, again, that, the, the big issue there is solvency versus liquidity. Do you think uh, Italy is solvent or illi illiquid? I think you can make a pretty good case that, uh, um, that Italy is solvent. If the ECB uh, does become involved at a large scale, this will very much become a euro crisis. And the crisis will be about one thing. It will be about inflation. Okay, if there's one thing I'm sure of, it's ultimately inflation is the only game in town in terms of what determines currency values. The question will be, can the ECB prevent a run on some solvent countries without generating a big inflation? Okay, this, of course, is very much the question we ask ourselves at the Fed uh, these days. It's an age-old question of solvency versus liquidity. The central bank is a lender of last resort. It's rife with moral hazard, but it seems just an inescapable characteristic of the banking systems that we live with. Can the Fed pull it off? I'd say yes, uh, or possibly. Can the ECB? The likelihood's lower, okay, because they're uh, dealing with governments and banks, uh, but I wouldn't rule it out. Note that I've said nothing here about monetary <coughs> union. Conceptually, monetary union seems to me to be a sideshow. The main issue is about federalism, and the ability of a central bank to remain credible and independent while at the same time dealing with a financial panic uh, where a government can't meet its short-term financing lead, uh, needs because, uh, because of an interest rate spiral. Finally, uh, let me say uh, a couple things uh, that I'll borrow from Tom Sargent, the recent uh, Nobel laureate. Um, Tom said this, uh, in the 1780s, the U.S. is a basket case. There's 13 sovereign governments, 13 states. They have the ability to raise taxes and print money. And the center, the federal government, is horribly weak. Sounds pretty familiar, right? Mm -hmm. um, the federal government, they can print money, but they can't raise taxes. The, the, the center is dependent on individual states for contributions, and they typically don't give the contributions. Um, and then the Constitution is born. And it does the following. It gives the federal government the monopoly to raise the one tax at that time that really counts, the tariff. Okay, and uh, and uh, and the uh, it controls the, uh, uh, the the creation of money. The federal government immediately assumes all state debts and raises tariffs. The first thing that Alexander Hamilton and George Washington did was to raise taxes. They were spending 85% of their revenues to service their bonds. Bonds went from trading at a huge discount to trading at par. This is how the U.S. was born, with a determined solution that the pro to, to the problem that Europe is facing right now. Okay? It was kind of a political miracle, and I think that puts in context the challenges uh, that uh, the European Federation faces. Um, at the end of his comments, Tom said, there's no new issues in economic theory. Alexander Hamilton knew all of them. The difficult thing is the politics, and I can't help you with that. <laughs> My words, the U.S. has a huge debt problem right now. Perhaps the worst of it exists at the state and municipal level. It's a good thing that the U.S. doesn't have a currency problem right now just to exacerbate things. It's a good thing that Michigan can't devalue its way to competitiveness with the Carolinas. This would just be one more, 
thing to worry about. If Europe could see its way clear of worrying about all these nominal units, <coughs> perhaps it could fo focus more effectively on the deeper rooted problems. Okay, unfortunately, politically, this is a lot easier said than done. Okay, so the takeaway from these comments is, is, is simply that uh, uh, the majority of the, uh, what do we mean by, is it a Euro crisis, is political, uh, not economic. Sorry if I went a bit long. Okay, before we take any questions, uh, for those of you, um, you know, we're all in different businesses, different industries, some of us are working, some of us are students. Um, you know, the professors uh, sit on a lot of different committees and have insights, so if inadvertently any of you are to share any insider information, please don't trade on it unless you're a member of the House of Representatives and feel free to go right ahead. <laughs> it's perfectly legal. Um, are there any questions from the floor? I had a series, as I was listening to this, I was taking notes, and, and Professor Goodfriend, um, you were talking about credit, credit policy favors, you know, that, that may be unintentional. I was thinking about our tax code, where, you know, over the years, it's been morphed. You know, if we want to encourage marriage, we, you know, we write the tax code one way. If we want to encourage home ownership, we write the tax code one way. Are you kind of implying that, you know, as we get further and further into credit policy, we're kind of going down that same road? inadvertently uh, or, or purpose yeah, well I'm partly but what I was saying I was that talking about credit policy executed by an independent central bank okay so it's important to get the distinction I'm not saying that the US Congress is the duly elected duly constituted authority over fiscal policy cannot make judgments as to which part of society it wants to favor. That's politics. Okay. And that's what they're entitled to do, and that's what they should be doing. That's how politics works. But the independent Federal Reserve is not authorized to make those decisions. It's the independent. The point I was making, I didn't get enough chance, I'm glad you asked this question, is that what's happening with the Federal Reserve is the politics is pushing the Fed, in my view, in a corner okay. to do the dirty work that the politics is not willing to take on itself. And that's where I draw the line. If the politics wants to do it, that's okay with me, but let's do it in the open, in a discussion on, in Congress, and not have the, op what the Federal Open Market Committee of 12 individuals, seven of whom can vote this thing, uh, take the heat off Congress, it gives Congress the option of, of blaming the Fed after the fact that things didn't work out based on the politics. Uh, that's just a, a losing game for the Fed, and I think for the country as a whole. It's basically going around the rule of law. Right. Good point. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Sir, Dr. Goodfriend, when, when uh, you laid out the options of the Fed and now most of them are none of them are good ideas, I'm curious what you think the Fed should do at this point. Uh, well, I think the Fed has done an awful lot. It should sit tight and, and get gather some more data. Um, it's far from clear what direction the economy is going in, and it's also far from clear that the Fed is really the cause of the problems at this point. Um, you know, we could get into that later if you all want to, but uh, I, I would say that the Fed is not the cause of our, of our stagnation. There are other reasons and largely having to do with the politics of fiscal policy and um, regulation and so forth. I don't think, the, I think the Fed has done enough. The time is to wait and see and perhaps not do much more. Ultimately, I think the Fed is responsible for stabilizing prices, preventing deflation, all, all right, but also preventing inflation. Do you think the dual mandate is uh, the dual mandate is a great idea, and, and, and what, to my mind, what evidence and what I said here today suggests is that um, caution is the, is the way to go because my opening remarks pointed out that if the Fed unleashes an inflation on average over the next decade, the unemployment, based on what happened in the great inflation period and based on how hard it is to catch up against inflation, whether or not the Fed succeeds in pushing the unemployment rate down temporarily, and that's questionable inflation will unleash a percentage point or two higher unemployment on average over the following decade or two, and I think that's the problem. Yes? You talk a lot about failures of governance. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, failures of valuation, uh, specifically, uh, Dr. Speck mentioned Basel III. Is that even feasible uh, anymore to, to value a bank, uh, or is it a sort of you can know how fast you're going or where you are? Uh, but you can't know both. Well, um, 
Well, I think there's a I think there's a lot of problems with the, I think there's a lot of problems with the with the Basel framework. Um, um, I, I, I um, you know, so in that sense, I'm sympathetic to the to the question. But you know, I I, th I think one of the first order observations is I I I I I, th I think the the feature of it that I that I highlighted, namely the zero risk weights for sovereign credit. Um, just kind of puts out into stark relief the fundamental conflict of interests um, that that governments have um, in 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 organizing the system and the need for go for government. Just as governments are concerned that private parties not have conflicts of interest, um, I think governments should be sensitive to the conflicts of interest associated with their um, with, with with the frameworks that they create. To, to inherently bias um, things so that um, that fin financial institutions have have strong incentives to in, in, in invest to some extent in in, insti in institutions that may be weren't fully solvent. Um, um, this seems to me kind of part of the problem, and I think part of how our how the architecture of our system. Um, has led to sort of fundamental structural problems. <coughs> Even if you can see that that stuff is not risk free, uh, right? You just get a, a wider and wider range of values, sometimes wider than the capitalization of the banks. It, it's a political. Uh, well, it's a it's a uh, it's a political issue. I you know I think with respect to the the issue of bank capital structure, I you know I, sh I probably should should probably indicate I, I happen to have been one of 20 uh, signers of a of a letter in the Financial uh, Times a year ago um, that called for dramatically higher capital standards and and the reason the reason um, th that I'm, I'm on record as calling for dramatically higher capital standards is because of a a, a basic a basic idea um, that we we <coughs> emphasized. Uh, in our in our in our finance courses at Carnegie Mellon, called them, uh, and that's been emphasized in finance courses at Co Carnegie Mellon for more than half a century. It's called the Mendigliani Miller's theorem. Um, this this point this basically points out that equity and debt uh, are, are are substitutes and are alternative ways to fund ent enterprise. Um, and just because financial institutions like to fund themselves by debt because debt is subsidized in in a whole myriad of different ways. Including, as we've learned over the last few years, with too big to fail um, types of types 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 of guarantees, um, that that doesn't fundamentally mean that in a in a social sense that that debt is cheaper um, 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 th than equity, or or, or or that or that or that or that just because banks prefer to fund themselves in that way because of their private incentives, it's not obvious to me that our financial system ought to be set up. Ought to, ought to be ought to be ought to be set ought to be set up at all uh, that way, Professor Spat. It was kind of interesting in in your comments. I'm summarizing in my words uh, that you know it's almost like the banning the naked hedging was like the kill the messenger type of thing. Where I mean there there is some informative value we're getting from the markets that maybe those in government are so close to it can't see. So examine that information instead of. Killing the messenger. That, that that was exactly one of the themes in my in my in, in my comments, and I was it, it, it was, I was really struck, especially by the ban. I'm, I'm struck right now by the extent to which some of the European governments have been ag aggressive on this issue, and and I was also struck in 2008 at um, the dramatic change in, in Chris Cox's attitude about this issue, basically. Um, from September uh, of 08, in the midst of the crisis, uh, under enormous pressure from his colleagues in the president's working group, to what he said in his exit, and to what he told the Washington Post in his exit interview, um, and I and I think you know I think the, you know I, I think the attitude of some of the other policymakers in, in the U.S. Uh, about this issue, you know, re ref reflected uh, what they what they were what I think in, in particular the attitude of the Treasury. On this issue was what they were hearing from some of their friends, uh, from some of their friends on Wall Street. Um, um, it was convenient for some of the from some of the high-profile CEOs on Wall Street to bl to blame sh to bl to blame short sellers, um, for example, for taking down their back to taking down their enterprises. Uh, I would have looked a little. I, I think these CEOs should have looked somewhat more inwardly 
They should have looked at what were the risk management practices uh, that they followed, what were the leverage policies um, um, that, they, that, that, that they were followed, uh, that they followed, what was the value of the stuff that was on, what was the, what was the, what was the value in the marketplace of the stuff that was on, on, their, on, their, on, their, on their books. It was that that basically made, made, a lot, made, a, made a lot of these institutions, frankly at the time, insolvent. Um, um, you know, it wasn't simply a liquidity. Um, you know, whether, you know, whether Bear Stearns was a liquidity crisis, I think is, deba is, de is debatable. And, and certainly, you know, as things played out, it was clear that many institutions were insolvent, you know, whether, whether it be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, et cetera. Uh, Professor Spess, as you brought up, big to fail. And bank cap rates, for that matter, as well. You know, another solution to increasing banks' capitalization rates is going back to Glass-Steagall. You could arguably say that if you did that, too big to fail places would have lower volatility of their assets, so they could have lower capitalization rates and still be sustainable. I understand there's certain costs that would go with this and why banks, investment banks, wouldn't want this, but why isn't this a, a good or a reasonable solution? Well, um, you know, I, I think my, my view about this is that, the, my view is I, pro I probably wouldn't be inclined to approach the problem in that, my, my own view is I probably, my personal view is I probably wouldn't be inclined to approach the problem in this way. I don't think it's an unreasonable kind of approach. Um, but, but my feeling is a, a, both that approach and a lot, and certainly a lot of the detailed directions in Dodd-Frank um, and, and, I, and I feel more strongly about the, the, about the Dodd-Frank piece, a lot of the detailed directions in, in Dodd-Frank have been focused on, sort of on, in my mind, on the wrong issues. Um, they, they, you know, they, they, put, they seem to be oriented toward putting lots of frictions in our, in our financial system, which I don't view as actually particularly uh, healthy. Uh, uh, I mean, putting the frictions in, I don't view as particularly uh, healthy. Uh, you know whether we're going to have much of a derivatives market that that's that's that survives. I think is kind of very much uh, of an of an open issue. For example, um, the the Vo the Volcker rule, while it was well motivated, um, the you know wh whether dealers are going to be able to function as dealers is now sort of an open question. Um, the re the regulators in their preliminary proposals with respect to the Volcker rule. Um, Basically, you know, they, they, you know, it's one thing to sort of say, okay, these firms, they shouldn't have proprietary sh trading shops. But when, when one goes to implement this and decide it, our particular trade, what are the metrics by which we evaluate whether, wh whether too much of the trading activity of a firm is, what does it mean to, for, cust for trades to be customer facilitation? You know, it, it, it's, it seems to me this cuts to kind of the fundamentals of a of a of a trading of a of a of a of a, of a, of a trading business. You know, and meanwhile now, what, what 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 we have is that at every turn, the Fed wants to bring everybody under its umbrella. You know, it wasn't just that Goldman Sachs um, and 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 Morgan Stanley were sort of swept in um, a couple uh, in 2008, but now in recent weeks. Basically, the the derivatives business of Bank, of Bank America um, ha, has been has been transferred over um, to the to the Fed jurisdiction. I I, fi I find this kind of just pretty much indefe pretty much indefensible. Um, if, I, if I could follow up, that's actually what you're talking about. It's almost like a halfway point between where we are and what we were a few years ago versus Glass Steagall time. And at best, that's unclear. At worst, it's significantly worse. That's kind of why I bring it up, because instead of going to this in-between point where it's unclear what the role of the financial institutions are, we have a defined area where we know what well yeah, and, and, and I think kind of the, what, what, what my posture is maybe is in some ways not that different. This is why I'm calling for high capital standards. Um, I really see high capital standards as a substitute for a, 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 a lot of these kind of very odd rules that are, are going to create lots of friction, that are going to create lots of frictions. And it seems to me we ought to let the financial institutions ultimately internalize um, whether, th whether, for example, there's a lot of, is there a lot of synergies between investment banking and commercial bank? Commercial banking? Well, let's let you know. I'm I'm okay. So this is maybe where I would have a different, a little bit different point of view. So I'm okay with the institutions sorting this out on their own, as long as they're going to absorb, as long as the, they're going to have the markets absorb uh, the costs 
um, uh, that they're the, and and not and not sort of simply lay it off, lay it lay it off on the rest of us. That and, and so that's where that's sort of the foundation for my view. I'm not suggesting that's necessarily the the the, the only the only the only coherent view. Uh, I have a question for Professor Telmer. Um, when you were going through your five points, it was it was ironic. I was thinking about the fourth point. Um, I'm an investor. I, I, I buy stocks, and you've seen over the past. 50, 60 years on a much shorter cycle than maybe Europe. You know, you'll see a company that wants to be a conglomerate, and GE will buy all these different separate divisions and companies. And then 10 or 15 years later, it's now we're all about lean and mean, and we're going to shut off that, the, the non essential stuff and we're going to focus on our core industries. And then another 10 or 15 years later, we're, we're building back up the conglomerate. Uh, Europe's oversimplifying over a much longer process. You know, I was wondering, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, for 40 years we've been trying to get together and get some synthesis. And now that we got it, it's like, ah, eh, well, geez, you know, let's get back to lean and mean. Let's get rid of the weak ones and just focus on Germany, France, and that. Hey, it sounded like you said it, it's too <coughs> inexpensive to go, it's too expensive to go backwards. So, no, I, I, I wanted to draw a clear distinction between. Uh, European political and economic integration, yeah. which I, I think that's uh, your metaphor speaks right. to what that is, yeah. and monetary integration, just uh, simply uh, using the same units to pay for things <coughs> and save and so on. Okay, I think uh, where all the big all the big issues are is in the former, mm -hmm. and and not the latter. And that's kind of what I meant by I think. Uh, this is a, a euro currency crisis is kind of a sideshow, and the, and the issues that we really ought to be arguing about are, uh, are what your metaphor speaks to. When do you, th I mean, do you think it's practical, and it, other than you know, some incredible urgency, is it practical at any point in time that they're going to collect revenues together as opposed to just financing debt together? No. I mean, I, I uh, you, you can stretch see, it out. Wanna, wanna, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when uh, just think about how many referenda that, uh, have happened in Europe since Maastricht, right. and how many have passed. I think the answer is zero. Uh, that might uh, somebody can can perhaps correct me, uh, but it's there's not popular political support for uh, political integration uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, um, well, we've just been, you know, we've been watching in the markets, and I say we, I mean investors in general, <coughs> that um, if you try and fix it country by country, then all the investment community does is say, okay, well, where's the next weakest one? So, okay, patch up Greece, then fine, I'm going to focus on Italy. Patch up Italy, I'm going to focus on Spain, and you, you just keep going through that. So I, I loved your analysis of, of taking it back to the, the federalism and the colonial states and that idea that you know, you, you've really got to approach it from that level. There's, a, there's another economist that, that um, works for J.P. Morgan, uh, Dr. Kelly, um, and he's kind of looked at it the same way, you know, that they, they, you can't keep fixing this ailment by ailment. You know, you need to, you need to get back and, and really fix the whole thing, but, you know, how can you get that with 17 different cultures and 17 different things? Questions in the audience? Yes, please. Back there, Joe. You painted such a rosy picture. Uh, I hope I'm not being too sarcastic. Where are you investing your own portfolio in light of your apples? So who's that question? Uh, <laughs> it could be any of us. I just taught uh, a, a class, uh, and Drew was in it, and I did what I, what I taught you, which is uh, diversified portfolio, uh, you know, asset allocation, globally diversified, and uh, um, not a lot of active management. Um, but, uh, you know, I invest my money globally, and, and uh, in, in spite of my uh, my skepticism about the uh, economic um, benefits of all these currencies and so on, so you guys, yeah, so um, so I, I you know I, I guess I would point to a, a couple of things. Uh, um, I, I, I you know I I also try to diversify my my recent portfolio structures have been pretty passive. 
that's actually characterized my, my investing over, over, over several decades, with the exception of when I've been able to identify sy systematic uh, structural mispricing, sometimes in sort of non-market ways, frankly. Um, and then I've tried to sort of seize those opportunities as aggressively uh, as, as I can, as sort of an, over, as an overlay uh, on top. So, 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 so sometimes I try to use the idea of sort of arbitrage or near, near, near arbitrage in my, my portfolio. I've, I've also, you know, as some of you know, I have a lot of expertise on asset allocation and taxes. Um, so I've tried to, to some degree, inter, you know, internalize those ideas as I manage uh, my, 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 port, my, my portfolio. Uh, at, at, at times when I've had opportunities um, wh where the, the opportunities in, involve some, in effect, leverage or expansion of, 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 of credit because of, of some frictional kind of situation, I might try to borrow, 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 um, borrow low and, and invest high. I'm doing a little bit, little bit of that in so some particular uh, uh, context right now. And then finally, I should know one thing I'm not doing right now. Um, um, I don't. I don't have any. I don't have. I don't have any material amount of assets in money market funds. Um, my, my description of money market funds in the current environment is sort of roughly the following: Here's an asset category um, that only has one way to go, uh, and it ain't up. Um, you have an asset that is earn, that pay that is paying a zero return. Um, you know, I consider three basis points as like zero. Um, so you've got an asset that's paying a zero return. And the only thing that can happen um, um, is that the return be substantially less than zero. <laughs> now you might say, well, how could that happen? Well, you know, the, the, the rumors are that the money market funds have 40% of their exposure in European banks. I don't know that I need to necessarily say more because think about what the European, think about what the European banks are, are investing in. They're probably not so much investing in US treasuries um, it's probably more in some sovereigns on the other side um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Atlantic. Now, the one, the one saving grace in the money market funds is it may be that, that the U.S. government, kind of like it did last time, um, might step in and be protective. Now, last time the U.S. government was protective of all but the first money market fund, that is the reserve fund. So the reserve fund, it let the reserve fund collapse. You know, on the other hand, one reading of the political environment right now is that there might be a reluctance, although I don't know which way it'll cut, because you know, if, if you do have contagion coming over from Europe, it's not clear which way the political vibe uh, would cut with respect to the, money, to, the, to the money market fund industry. But there is a huge orientation right now against too big to fail. And so you know, whether one is protect, I, I, I think I would feel more comfortable getting a zero return and you can get better than zero return, but I would feel more comfortable getting a zero return for in an insured in an insured bank account, where there wouldn't have to be new new federal authority to provide the insurance, but insured bank account. And in, and in fact, in some cases, those bank accounts aren't paying zero, but they're paying one percent. That seems to me to completely dominate the the money the money money funds as a money market mutual funds as an as an asset category. Professor Goodman. Uh, I am, uh, I'm not a finance economist, so I'm going to make a point about fiscal policy, which is a point I'm going to make. So, so I'm going to say, and I think, you know, we're all driven into the arms of finance, of financial markets, partly because the government is so irresponsible. And I make this point a lot when, I, when this comes up. In, this, in the periods in history where governments have had price stability, see, the gold standard in Britain in the 19th century, and managed their fiscal affairs responsibly, Real government debt, or consoles, which were infinitely matured government debt, paid a pretty good real return, two or three percent year in and year out, guaranteed to be price stable purchasing power terms. Um, it's a nat if our governments uh, kind of stuck to their knitting and provided government debt, long-term government debt with stable prices, we get a pretty good real return, possibly two or three percent, without worrying. I mean, I mean, without worrying. Now, the problem is um, people were chased out of those long-term nominal bonds in the United States because of the great inflation. I'm, I'm a repetitive person. The great inflation wiped out long-term government debt in the 70s and 80s. 
And then people said, well, we're not going to expose ourselves to long-term nominal debt. We're going to buy short-term CDs. And I like to tell the story. My mother did that. My father had the long-term debt. My mother said, I'm not going there. She had short-term CDs, and guess what? She got stuck with, I'm repetitive again, interest rate risk. Short-term interest rates, zero. To me, that this is really an outrage, that our government has not provided safe harbors for, for people. And so we're thrown into the arms of, I love financial markets, but I would love to have a safe harbor so we don't have to worry about this kind of thing. So I think the problem starts again with government policy and mismanagement of fiscal affairs. I think we're, I think we're going to summarize here so that we can share a little bit more fraternity and uh, wine and goodies in the back. But it is ironic. I, you know, our firm works with 2,000 investors throughout 17 states, and it's ironic that the whole idea of sovereign debt, which was supposed to be the safest of safe, because it's backed by the taxing authority and it's, you know, it, it can, you know, the, the sovereigns have an infinite time horizon. And yet you look at the scary stock market and you look at, you know, would I rather own Coke, which has a product that's sold around the globe that can control their revenues and even if there's some global recession, has some ability and some stability that might be much better than Greece or Italy. It's one thing to be able to have the sovereign right to tax your people, but can you collect it? Can you get it? You know, you, you've, you've gone down. A, it's, it's really, it's made risk very different. I mean, I learned so many wonderful things from these gentlemen, but, you know, it's the, the efficient frontier is, is starting to look a little out of skew when what was safe is no longer safe. And if I buy a 10-year treasury at 2% and there's any amount of inflation, you know, you do the modified duration and the principal loss racks up pretty quickly on something that's supposed to be the safe harbor versus taking risk in other places. But thank you all so much for being here. I'm sure Janice wants to say a few concluding words. Let's uh, uh, thank our professors.